Good day. I am H. Robert Silverstein, MD, for the Preventive Medicine Center and West Hartford Cable Access TV. This is the program putting it all together. If you have any questions, you may phone me at the office at 860-549-3444. And uh, if you have any input, uh, we'll be glad to hear it. Now, I want to quickly run through some things because I have a special guest today. Uh, first of all is an article about um, binge drinking. And these words were used to describe people who have binge drinking. They have low levels of persistence and self-directedness. I've read that 10 times. I'm not quite sure what it means, but some of you can catch on to that. Low levels of persistence and self-directedness. So uh, hang on to that. Next, everybody loves vitamins. Oh my goodness, uh, take your vitamins. No, don't take your vitamins. Take your vitamins not more than five days a week, and in my book, uh, Maximum Healing, I say Wednesday and the weekend off. There can be too much of a good thing. Uh, for instance, oxygen. We are not supposed to breathe 100% oxygen, and in babies, that has an adverse effect on their eyes. So don't take vitamins every day, but I have the name of a vitamin that I think is worth your attention, and I think it's particularly good for eyes. I have a patient whose macular degeneration stopped on a dime when I put her on astaxanthin, A-S-T-A-X-A-N-T-H-I-N. So I would recommend taking astaxanthin four days a week one week, five days a week the next week, and don't be worried or concerned if you can't keep track of what's what, but definitely not seven days a week. I'm absolutely against multivitamins. I think they do all kinds of bad things. All right, that's the astaxanthin discussion. All right, skip that. And next, uh, chronic kidney disease. Article from the New England Journal of Medicine. There are many people with chronic kidney disease, and it turns out Nutritional Management of Chronic Kidney Disease, New England Journal of Medicine, November 2nd, 2017. How's that for being up to date? And the point is, the article does not come out strongly, but if you can read between the lines, it strongly recommends a vegetarian or near vegetarian diet. Now, I, I use the word strongly. It does not strongly, but that is a message that you can easily pick out, and it is what I recommend. You do have to be careful. Every diet, you have to be careful of something. Turns out animal protein raises the uremic factors, they're called, and vegetarian diet can raise potassium. So you have to find that balance. And you say, okay, I've got the balance. The balance is way over in the direction of vegetarian. Next, uh, migraine headaches, a combination of coenzyme Q10, a vitamin, fever few, and magnesium for the prevention of migraine headaches. Let's see. And lastly, the Whole Foods Diet. Uh, Life Extension Foundation has an interesting magazine, uh, and I subscribe to it. I learn from it. Uh, they're always selling vitamins and way too many vitamins. But this time, for the first time, they've had someone who talks about a vegetarian diet. They've always been in the Mediterranean diet direction. And um, uh, I must say that my healthiest patients are vegans. My healthiest patients are vegans. Vegans have a 50% lower carbon footprint. So you not only help the environment, you help yourself prevent all kinds of diseases by being or approaching. I'm never rigid. I'm always a little bit flexible. Now, um, enough of that. Uh, he, he, okay, uh, his phone is going out. Next, I have a guest. I feel a little strange around this guest. First of all, he's an attorney, and that shouldn't bother me too much unless I've broken the law. Uh, but second of all, a couple of people, important people in my life that I know, talk to me. I don't mean to embarrass him, but they tell me how intelligent he is, and it's a little intimidating for me. Uh, I'm okay intelligence, and yes, I can think, but one gets the difference that attorney Stephen Seligman is in a different class. Now, when you talk to him, he seems as normal as the weather outside. But uh, we'll see what we can get out of him today. Stephen, welcome to the show. Well, good morning, Dr. Silverstein, and thank you very much for having me. If I were a hypochondriac after your opening, I'd be rolling on the floor <laughs> <I'd> for ventilator <laughs> right now. Very, it's very impressive the way you do stay up to date and maintain 
information regarding developments in nutrition, developments in healthcare, and it's use, it's great that somebody like yourself, who's well grounded in conventional medicine, therefore has the credibility to say, I understand conventional medicine, and I am therefore credible in d disagreeing with certain conventions and trying to be a little more cutting edge. Very informative. It is interesting what Steve says uh, that, uh, yes, uh, I am looked upon as a little bit strange by some people in conventional medicine, but I want to talk for a moment about conventional medicine and get Steve's take on what I'm about to say. Conventional medicine, I was thinking about writing an article, and the article had something to do with the title, Did Big Pharma Win? And the reason I chose that title is because I got fired uh, working in a clinic at our hospital because I wanted to know why patients did things. I went down to the clinic. I was looking to do something, maybe get a job and so on and so on. And I kept going back to the patient and saying, why is this happening? Why is that happening? And what I came to realize was the, the resident would go in find out what the problems were, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, whatever, and then they'd write the prescriptions. So medicine has very much become, what's your problem? Here's your prescription. And that's why I came up with that supposed title for an article that I probably won't write called, Did Big Pharma Win? Why are physicians thinking that way? And I will tell you this, it's very efficient. It's much more efficient than what I do. What I do takes time. And I'm not bragging, but it just happens to be me. Steve, your take on that. One size doesn't fit all. That's especially true in healthcare. And listening to the patient, certainly part of my practice is suing doctors for medical malpractice. <laughs> and, I will, and I will tell anybody who wants to know that my, my relationship with Dr. Silverstein does not arise out of my ever having sued him. Indeed, uh, the people we know in common speak very highly of him. But what the common denominator among doctors who have failed their patients is that they're not good listeners. And that's true in your profession and in mine, that yes, we are the experts, but it is the patient or the client who we professionals are trying to help and in order to do that, you really have to understand what their circumstance is. And not every, not every problem calls for the same solution. Certainly, I'm not going to presume to tell you about your own profession, things you don't already know. But it's in pharma's interest to get the resident reflexively to pull out the prescription script because it's much easier than thinking about things. Now, it may be the right thing to do. And Lord knows, it, in our lifetimes, the, the strides that medical science, and specifically uh, pharmaceuticals, have taken is tremendous. Look at what we've done with at least managing AIDS and all, and all manner of cancers, though even we, our approach to the treating of cancer has gone from these highly mordant, toxic, chemotherapies to immunotherapy and trying to harness the body's own defenses. But without denying the remarkable accomplishments that medical science has achieved, every single patient, I assume, like every single client, has his or her own needs that aren't necessarily served by conventional wisdom. Steve triggered a number of thoughts in me. Uh, First of all, after he talked about malpractice, I got a little <laughs> nervous. Uh, that may be what's in the no past, but what doctor <laughs> ever has to, uh, people ask me to talk about practicing defensive medicine, and I say, no, go be a good doctor. Steve says that, but I'll tell you, I do a lot of things defensively that I know I don't have to do, but I'm protecting myself when I do them. Uh, anyhow, what I was thinking is, Steve made a very good point. I came across as if I'm against medications. That is not true. He hit the nail on the head. There are medications that have made a wonderful difference. Uh, 
you might say to me, well, what if the patient doesn't listen to you? Should you give them medications? And the answer is, of course you should, even if they listen to you partially. It's not 100% of the light is on, the light is off kind of circumstance. And usually there is a blend. They will do some of the things you say, and then you will prescribe medications, hopefully as little as possible. Um, I have a handout that's intended to be funny, uh, but uh, number three on that is all drugs are poison, including the ones I prescribe, including vitamins, minerals, herbs, and supplements, be well used as few as possible. And that is a true statement. Do things as naturally as you can if you want your maximum freedom. Now, I've got to stop on that word and say, Steve, talk to me about freedom, human freedom. Certainly, it's a big, it's a big issue now. People talk about freedom from government, freedom from regulation. And like everything else, there, there has to be a balance. We're, we're living through a political time now where one of the rallying cries was roll back government, roll back regulation. Regulation has made it more expensive to do business in this country. Well, regulation came about because the industries and the products that are now regulated needed regulation because without regulation, people were rapacious and there was nothing to check industries, governments, banks. Uh, in 2008, our economy collapsed. Uh, and now in 2016 or 2017, we will, certainly during the 2016 election, we're asking, people are asking to roll back the regulation of banks to permit precisely the same kind of conduct that a few short years ago threw this country into, what, into the worst recession since the, the Great Depression of, uh, of 1929. So the freedom, freedom is like anything else. It's, it's a virtue and like nuclear power can be used for good or for evil. But freedom, all, freedom from what and freedom to do what have to be the questions. And merely to be, I mean, every kid wants to be free from his unreasonable parents who say, <laughs> be home at a certain time, do your homework, don't drive too fast, don't stay out too late at night. Every kid wants to be free, but not every kid left to his or her own devices is going to make good choices. So we, like everything else in life, we need balance. Uh, I want to know, really, in, in, we live in one of the least repressive societies on the face of the earth. We are sold, we're being told these days that um, America is the most taxed country in the world. That's nonsense. So in the name of freedom, we're being sold several bills of goods, whether it's the right of the pharmaceutical industry to have less testing and generate more drugs. Look at what's going on with the whole opioid crisis. What was its, gener its genesis? It was the absence of regulation over the prescribing and the distribution of these opioids. So freedom as a virtue is a wonderful thing. And Lord knows America celebrates freedom, freedom from tyranny, uh, freedom from fascism. But frequently we're being told that in the name of freedom, we have to give the rich and the powerful a pass. And I'm opposed to that. Steve talks about, uh, he used his phrase, I would use in medicine the concept of cost or risk and benefit. That's the way we're trained to think. Uh, there's a colon in there, cost or risk, and then colon, and then benefit. And as he implies, there's, there is this pendulum that swings between too much and too little. Uh, in my growth and development, my father was um, in business and he was in the coal business. Well, the coal mining unions uh, were out of control. They were really, now they had been abused before. Then they became dictatorial and controlling and so on. And of course, things swung back uh, halfway through. Okay, fine. Uh, and then things swung back. And of course, eventually the coal industry uh, disappeared in terms of heating homes. Uh, the home I grew up in had coal heat initially, and then we switched over to oil and so on. And I have gas heat now. But um, it is that concept. He introduced a word that runs throughout what I think, and that is balance. 
And finding that balance is a real measure of maturity. And most people don't really have a good, well, I take that back. A lot of people don't have a really good sense of balance about how fast to drive or how slow to drive or how much money to spend on this or not spend on that uh, or behave this way or that way. And as he says, we're in a contentious period now and uh, the wool is being pulled over our eyes in some areas. For instance, uh, Bloomberg gave a um, uh, speech at the graduation, I think it was last year or two years ago at the University of Michigan. And he talked about all these safe spaces and microaggressions. He says that's terrible that those things exist because you need to be confronted and allow open discourse. And again, I think it's interesting that Michael Bloomberg, former uh, New York City mayor, uh, very successful, would have this feeling about the necessity of allowing disagreeable speech to be given permission. Stephen, comments. Mike Bloomberg is a fascinating guy. I don't want to talk just about him, but some of the things that he's espoused, because there, there are some contradictions. Uh, our, our hypersensitivity today to upsetting people uh, is doing society a disservice. Uh, shows like this exist and should exist because there should be a free and robust exchange of ideas. And if all we're going to be permitted to do is extol the virtues of puppies and kittens with big adoring eyes, we're not going to dis discuss the things that are going to make us a better society. So on, on one level, uh, permitting, indeed encouraging, genuine, robust exchange of ideas, which are so discouraged now on college campuses, and we have to worry about offending uh, the sensibilities of our little, precious college students, uh, is a very bad thing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Michael Blumberg, uh, clearly nobody sitting here today is going to extol the virtues of 32 ounces of hyper-sweetened <laughs> beverages such as Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Uh, but, but I don't want government, as Michael Blumberg tried to do through taxation of beverages in New York City, I don't want government telling me that I will spend some terrible, or suffer some terrible penalty for purchasing 32 ounces of a hyper-sweetened beverage. The penalty I will suffer from consuming that ought to be a sufficient deterrence and get me to pay more attention to my health. So uh, Michael, again, without going into Michael Blumberg per se, who I think on balance is a fabulous guy, uh, his, 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 his urged freedom on us uh, in some instances and really try to impose his own will on us as it relates to things that we put into our bodies. And like to th I, I think human beings have to have the opportunity to fail in order to learn to make their own decisions. Uh, I'm a former two-pack-a-day smoker. And uh, all I can say is that being both a physician and a former smoker, I was glad when taxation was placed heavily on cigarettes. Now, the point that Steve makes, I'm not arguing with him, but on the other hand, I was rather happy about it. Certainly libertarians uh, who believe let people make choices and experience the consequences. Uh, here's a great quote. You chose it, uh, accept your choices, experience the consequences, learn from it and change, and, or don't. And uh, that also goes humorously with, uh, I usually heard this saying uh, it, with a German accent, we grow too old soon and too smart late. Uh, that's true. And you can develop uh, some important conditions. I'm uh, pulling up something I want to read to you about Michael Bloomberg. Uh, so uh, this is what I put in. I put in the, the very quote that he, 10 minutes, okay, fine. Michael Bloomberg, the fact that some university boards and administrations now bow to pressure and shield students from these ideas through safe spaces, code words, and trigger warnings is in my view a terrible mistake. The whole purpose of college is to learn how to deal with difficult situations, not run away from them. And Steve and I were both supportive of that. But getting back to the hyper-sweetened uh, 32 ounce drinks, uh, Steve's position is you'll suffer the consequences. As a former smoker who knew I needed to stop smoking, I will tell you that the addictive tendency, like I read to you about uh, the binge drinkers, let me read it again. 
binge drinkers, low levels of persistence and self-directedness. That is a sort of a general description of much of where our country is at the present time. It's not just the binge drinkers. And my point is that it's hard for people to stop eating those foods and those drinks and those smoke that are going to hurt them in the future. Now, I know, Steve, you just spoke on this, but what do you think about what I just said? I was a three-pack-a-day smoker. If I was down to a carton of cigarettes, and I was, as you know, a pretty good tennis player and a pretty good swimmer. Uh, and throughout the period that I was playing tennis very unsuccessfully for a living, I was smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. And I, I laughed at your, at the, the traits of the binge drinker because there's tremendous persistence. Because if you're a junkie, as you and I were, if yes. we were addicted to tobacco, I was very attentive to how, how low was my inventory of cigarettes. And if I was down to a mere five or six packs, I had to go out, whether it was two in the morning, whether there was a raging blizzard, because God forbid I should light that last cigarette and want the next one, which inevitably I did, frequently lighting the new one from the embers of the old one. So I was, I was very persistent and Addicts work very hard at maintaining their inventory of whatever it is to which they are addicted. Uh, so, uh, that, so I also believe uh, that there are some things. I also thought, incidentally, when I did quit smoking, think of all the money I'd say, I should be worth 10 times what Bill Gates is worth today because, God, I spent, I spent an awful lot of money on cigarettes. And when I look now at the price of them, I really do, not only do I feel healthier, but I feel somewhat righteous. Boy, I'm smart. Boy, boy, I was smart to have stopped doing such stupid, stupid things. Um, I want to change gears completely. Uh, I told you before in the introduction that uh, Steve's very intelligent. Been, your viewers have been disabused of that <laughs> our conversation <laughs> thus far. Uh, and um, I want to ask Steve about Yale. Now, Yale's one of those real prestige schools. In general, it's very hard to get into. Steve went to Yale. But I want you to talk to me not so much about the top students, but what about the middle and the lower end students that you saw while you were there? And just by the by, if you care to, uh, what was your grade average? Or, well, how did you do academically? Having been among the lower, low achieving <laughs> students, I got to know them the best. The, the, the saw, the chestnut about Ivy League schools is they're very hard to get into and very hard to flunk out of. Now, I went, I went to Yale in the early mid-70s. Probably was not the most disciplined of times. I, I will say that you look around and my first night at Yale uh, was 1972. My I walked into the suite to which I was assigned. I didn't know anybody was in there. One guy had just come back from, uh, from uh, Germany, from Munich, 1972 Olympics. We had bronze medaled for the, for the Canadian nation as a swimmer. There was a guy whose book of poetry was on sale at the Yale Co-op, and I had seen it that day when I had gone to buy books. And the third guy had just come back from having interned that summer for Walter Cronkite and CBS News, where he had covered the Republican National Convention in Miami and the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. And nobody was really puffing. They were simply telling, relating what they had done that summer. And they asked me what I had done, and I, I was a carpenter in Vermont. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I was a carpenter in Vermont for the summer. So. And, uh, and it was and a framer, nothing terribly skilled as well. So the, the, a lot of these people came with very impressive resumes. Uh, there was, even then, though, uh, there was a, a real uh, alumni. Uh, there was a certain affirmative action, typically for white Anglo-Saxon Protestant sons and daughters of alumni, and uh, they got in because they were legacies. But by and large, uh, very bright people. By and large, the professors, these were giants uh, in their fields, and the authors of the text. And, and there is some, something to be gained by the osmosis of being around bright people. 
So it, it, it was a tremendous, uh, tremendous experience. I, I did reasonably well in college, and uh, I'm, I'm glad I went. But, you know, the great thing about Robert Frost said, education is what you have left after you've forgotten everything that you've learned. And to be exposed to critical thinking, to be exposed to how do we take in and evaluate information, to be around people who are good at doing that, is tremendous no matter where you are. And it, when I look at young people today who are applying to college, and I see uh, young people who have gone to a whole variety of schools, invariably most people get a lot out of whatever school they go to. So to those parents and kids who are watching you tonight, uh, Robert, and worrying about where, where's my kid going to go, relax. Just encourage him or her to keep an open mind, to keep their eyes open, meet people from diverse backgrounds, and they will come home having, having gotten their money's worth from wherever they go to school. Steve makes a superb point. Uh, now it's a matter of insecurity on my part that I say I went to the Harvard of the Midwest. Well, why wasn't it Harvard? Well, that's, that's a funny story in and of itself. But uh, I went to the University of Michigan, uh, which is a great school. But Steve, the point that Steve made about college education does have to do with people applying themselves while they are there. Steve and I both know lots of people who came from very podunk schools who are outstanding in their field, and generally that's because they worked hard and paid attention. The point about going to Yale or the University of Michigan is that you're surrounded, as Steve pointed out, uh, the, the authors uh, of the textbooks that you're reading, uh, the writers of poetry, national prominence of all varieties, that sort of surrounds you and gives you a push in a particular direction that helps you grow and develop in the intellectual maturing sense. Now, there are bad stuff that comes with it too, but there's good stuff that comes with it also. And so the point is, it's a little harder to keep your focus at Podunk U than it is at Yale or the University of Michigan, where the entire focus is sort of around you. Now, what are we getting? We're getting one minute. Stephen, one minute. I, I have the privilege of teaching a section of trial practice at the University of Connecticut, teaching the evening school. The, my students come from very diverse backgrounds, and, and by the time they come to me, they're going to school at night. Bright hardworking kids from a, a, a whole host of backgrounds, very diverse. What counts is keep your ears open, keep your eyes open. Even though it's hard for a lawyer to say this, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. Well, I am H. Robert Silverstein, MD. Today's special guest was attorney Stephen Seligman of Katz and Seligman, uh, the law firm downtown in Hartford. Uh, for the Preventive Medicine Center and West Hartford Cable Access TV. Uh, good day to you all and hope you enjoyed the program.